Okay, we're going to get started here this, for this evening. And let's begin with a word of prayer, silent prayer. Lord, we ask that you would be with us as we open up a portion of your word that you might open our minds to uh, the things that are wondrous to behold from it and help us to understand it and to implement it. In Christ's name, amen. So we saw last time as we were talking here about apostasy, the historical order of Paul's letters as we do a quick review the last three epistles were his late epistles, and all three uh, dealt with uh, instructions to Timothy and Titus on how to be a pastor. In other words, when Paul's gone, uh, what, how are they going to lead the church? And we see the focus in these uh, epistles is on the Word of God. And I remember studying years ago like 55 references in these three epistles to an emphasis on the teaching of the Word of God. And so that's clearly the focus of sustainable Christianity, if you will, is the focus on the Word of God and teaching it. And we know from Ephesians 4 that that is what builds up the saints, individual believers, is the pastor-teacher teaching the Word and it included in this were multiple warnings about uh, apostasy. <clears throat> and there are two different references about the last days in First and Second Timothy, that difficult times are going to come. And in one instance, he says the Spirit explicitly says that. And so you see these end-time apostasy emphasis here in First Timothy 4, Second Timothy 3, Second Timothy 4, James 5, 1 through 8, 2 Peter 2, 2 Peter 3, and Jude, the book of Jude. The whole book of Jude is about it uh, right toward the end, <clears throat> uh, uh, written toward the end of the canon, that is. And so all but James, which is the first epistle, uh, the first book in the canon of the New Testament, are about warnings about uh, falling away from the faith, uh, going into apostasy. Apostasy relates, as I'll say again, to false doctrine, so doctrine, and secondly, immoral or ungodly behavior. And all of these are directed to what's happening in the church, not outside the church. <clears throat> the world has always been bad. And as Paul says in 2 Timothy, evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse. So cheer up, it's going to get bad before it gets worse, as I always like to say. Uh, so we saw in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3, the Spirit explicitly says an emphasis on what will happen in the latter times. And this is a hopox legomena, latter times, meaning it's the only place in the Greek New Testament where it occurs. And uh, last days is a common term that you have. But here he's saying in the latter times. That means right toward the end of the church age because the context is dealing with the church <clears throat> and the church age. In fact, 1 Timothy says that it was written in order to sh how to <clears throat> put in order the things in the church. So it's written to deal with how to set up a church, if you will, <clears throat> and uh, they're going to, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. And uh, doctrines of demons, of course, is a reference to the source. They're the source of this stuff. And, uh, you know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood and all of that. And as a result, it leads to hypocrisy of liars seared in their own consciences with the branding iron. That's why. These false teachers within the church cannot be reached <clears throat> by coming and approaching them <clears throat> with uh, an emphasis on the teaching of the Word of God. Let's get back to healthy doctrine. If they're the kind that Paul's talking about right here, then they're not going to respond. Their conscience 
has been seared. Now, a conscience refers to the part within you that discerns what is right and wrong. And so he's saying that it's like they've categorized their conscience. And they're not able to discern between good and evil. And he talks about some of the things that they do. And then in 2 Timothy, this is where we left off last uh, Thursday, he says, but realize this, in the last days difficult times will come. He's writing to pastors. It's going to be hard in the last days of the church age to be a pastor. And here's the reason why. For men will be lovers of self, and that is an inclusio in Greek, meaning the first and the, the last sentence is the main sentence, and everything in between is what it means to be a lover of self rather than lovers of God. Self-esteem, you ever heard of that? And all that kind of stuff? And so this is how the passage appears. Men will be lovers of self within the church here. And then he describes what that means to be a lover of self rather than a lover of God. A lover of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable. I believe it's 19 items. Malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. <clears throat> now, that first term, lovers of self, and the fact that it's going to happen in the last days of the church age, it, we, we've seen it in our lifetime. We saw, for example, Robert Schuller who wrote a book called Self-Love. And then, when I was a pastor in the early 80s, he, they sent, someone paid to send this other book called Self-Esteem, The New Reformation. See, he was wanting to, and I read the thing in the early 80s when it came out, it was sent a free copy to every pastor in America, basically. And he's saying that he was dethroning the Reformation of Calvin and Luther, which put an emphasis on the gospel, and he's overthrowing it with the, the doctrine of self-esteem. Now, if this doesn't fit the passage we just looked at, I don't know what does. And it's interesting, uh, another guy came out with a book, which was his PhD dissertation, and uh, he traced the doctrine of self-esteem to this guy, Frederick Nietzsche who lived from 1844 to 1900, a Jewish philosopher who taught that God was dead. And so Nietzsche taught, if God is dead, then the highest person for our affections is, is, is mankind, our self. And so he developed a whole new ethic out of the God is dead philosophy and uh, this guy in his dissertation showed that for the first time in the history, it was in the mid-1800s that the idea of self-esteem as a virtue came into the church. The Catholic church, the uh, Protestant church, especially the Protestant church, etc. And so this idea that you had to learn to love yourself or accept yourself um, before you can love others and love God, that's what was being taught back then, you know, is a heresy straight from unbelief. And Robert Schuller brought it into the United States, uh, and it was spread. I remember in the 80s it began to be accepted in evangelical circles. And Dave Hunt in 1985 wrote a book called Seduction of Christianity where he was exposing this. And I remember having Dave in Austin, and he met with a bunch of uh, pastors of our evangelical fellowships in Austin, and most of them were Dallas Seminary grads, and half of them were upset at Dave Hunt for criticizing the idea of self-esteem. And as Dave pointed out, nowhere does the Bible say you have to love yourself. In fact, it says you do love yourself. That's the problem. 
Uh, in other words, you take care of yourself, you get up, you brush your teeth, you fix your hair if you're a woman, <laughs> if you're not. Well, I think men fix their hair nowadays. They make it look sloppy or something, you know, like they just got out of bed. But nevertheless, uh, that kind of stuff, and he, he says that we're historically Christianity has taught that we're supposed to love God first. Those are the two great commandments, love God and love others as you already love yourself. There's not a third commandment there, you see. Uh, and they met, kind of turned it into that. And this, this is widespread. I know in public schools, that's not in the church necessarily, um, they talk about person's self-esteem, you know, and all of this kind of thing. <clears throat> and I remember watching the Olympics back in the 80s and all of a sudden, every time they'd interview somebody that won a gold medal or something, and they uh, ask them, well, what did you learn? I learned about myself. You know, self-actualization, supposedly. You know, you, 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 ca you cast yourself off from any obligations, from any outside influence, another person, and it's all about being true to yourself, to thine own self, be true. Now, that goes back to Plato or Aristotle, I believe you know, and all of that kind of stuff, but it's paganism recycled. And he's saying here that this self-esteem philosophy will, will come into the church in the last days, and we see it. And it results, it creates tremendous problems of shifting us away from the two great commandments to love God and love others. And if you do that, you know, this is why people get depressed primarily, you know, I'm not talking about if they have some physical reason, but they get pressed because they depressed because they they turn inward and get so self-absorbed. And as a result, if I turned inward and got self-absorbed, I'd be depressed. I'd probably commit suicide. I mean, it's pretty depressing when you look into your little depraved heart inside of you, uh, and so it's not surprising. And so. This passage goes on and says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come for men will be lovers of self rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness. So they've got some external thing that they believe is godly. You know, I, I used to hear all the time, well, so-and-so so nice, you know, but he doesn't believe in the deity of Christ. So and so, so nice, you know, and some other false teaching or doctrine. Well, I'm sorry, doesn't matter whether they're nice or not. You know, that is a form of godliness. In other words, some pseudo appearance of godliness, but they deny basic essentials of the Bible, you see. Don't be dissuaded by that. Don't be impressed. Well, they're such a nice, wonderful person. They have a scintillating personality and all of that. Of course, Satan has a great personality, I'm sure. Don't you think? I bet he's not a drag to talk to. And so he likes to use those kinds of people, <clears throat> holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. What is the power of God? It's the gospel. That is repeated over and over in Paul's writings. <clears throat> the power of the gospel is a supernatural thing that happens to people when they believe in Jesus Christ. It regenerates them. It seals them with the Holy Spirit. These are things uh, that God does. We do not believe in what's called synergism when it comes to the gospel. That is, that it's a little bit of man and a little bit of God. We're doing this great teamwork. No, it's all of grace, is it not? It's all of God. We're not syner synergist. We believe that salvation is totally a work of God. And so <clears throat> they hold to this external, and you'll see that throughout the New Testament in the Bible, this emphasis on external outside is what false teachers have and do. But when it comes to believing in the truth, believing in the word of God, they fall short at some point. And although they have denied its power and avoid such men as these, you're not supposed to fellowship with them. You're not supposed to hang around. 
The Bible actually talks in 2 Thessalonians 3 about shunning uh, people who are apostates within the church, people who have departed from the faith, and it says that we're not to have fellowship with them. I, I take it that they can still come to church or something like that, but they are not they're to be shunned. We're not to have a strong, deep personal relationship with that person. And of course, I'm sure uh, if this went out into the broader public, then I would be called some kind of a bunch of names for saying that. That based on <clears throat> a person's behavior and their standing in the truth, the Bible, the Word of God, that they should be shunned as a result of that. And so we see, moving on, in 2 Timothy 4, 3-4, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And this word endure means to regard with tolerance. Endure, bear up, put up with. In other words, they're not going to put up with it, with sound doctrine in these churches. And uh, they'll... Uh, for example, the Presbyterian Church USA requires that you have women elders. You have to have women elders, even though the Bible says you're not supposed to. Uh, we see the rise of homosexual pastor teachers and something, elders and things in the Episcopal Church and in other churches, the Methodist Church and stuff like this. In other words, there you have, with the homosexual issue, uh, killing two birds with one stone. It is a doctrinal defection, and secondly, it's also immoral. So you have both aspects of apostasy right there, and they, they want to make them the leaders in the church, you see? And so, I mean, how can anybody stay who's a genuine believer at a church like that? We're supposed to move on when you are in situations like that. I remember speaking at a church in Florida last year, and uh, some Presbyterian church, USA, had just adopted the pro-homosexual thing, and this independent church just down the road had 50 new people show up one Sunday <laughs> because they left that church because of that, because they wanted the Word of God. Many of them had been there their whole life. It was, it's tough when you leave a church you've been at it your whole life. You know, the social and friend uh, relationships that you developed over the years. But what's more important? Standing up for the Lord, uh, being faithful to Him, or maintaining your friendship in unbelief with these other people? And so he says... <clears throat> Uh, there'll come a time when in the church they will not endure sound doctrine. And, and, and this is the way certainly almost all of the denominations are, including the Southern Baptists that are supposed to be so wonderful that I grew up in. Uh, they have homosexual pastors here and there, uh, ordained women to the ministry here and there, and uh, frankly just don't teach the Word of God very well, although there's a trend. Uh, they're doing, some of the churches are doing a better job in the last 25 years than they have been in the past, but a lot of it's because they don't endure sound doctrine. They won't put up with sound doctrine. If you go in and teach sound doctrine in those churches, then you're going to lose a lot of people, which is good, really. It says, but wanting to have their ears tickled. This, this is their motive within the church. They want to have things, tickled ear is an idiom for uh, someone that wants something that makes them feel good. You ever heard of Joel Osteen? <laughs> well, Larry, uh, I'm not really a pastor. I'm a life coach, you know? Well... He's certainly influencing a lot of people. You know, that is apostasy, I'll tell you. I really don't know. It would be interesting to know what his father would think of him because he was a hellfire brimstone preacher if he was anything, and he believed in preaching the gospel. He, he had a lot of other areas I wouldn't agree with, but he believed in the gospel, and you never hear it. 
from Joel. He's a life coach, Larry, you know. So, and this is the idea of having your ears tickled. It means if people, we, we live in a psychologized uh, world. They want to come up with uh, psycho psychology reasons why people are having problems and not getting along. It couldn't be because they're sinners. Boy, you better not bring that up. And you would be kicked out of most Christian schools if you taught, uh, if you just took what Dr. Honer at Dallas used to call the vice list, where something like 70 something items, you know, that are, it, Jesus has a list, Paul has two or three lists, you put them together, like 73 descriptions of the fallen human nature, and not one of those characteristics is good. Put it that way. And, so that helps us to realize what is sin and what is not sin. And so many of these, quote, personality conflicts and things like that, you know, the temperaments and stuff, uh, that these things are often called sin that they consider today in the church personality conflicts. Well, it's not personality. Uh, it's... Uh, the sin nature working in a person. They call it things like bipolar. Well, the Bible calls it outburst of anger. Uh, you know, and children that are rebellious to their parents, uh, they call them hyperactive kids. I was a hyperactive kid, and my dad knew what to do with me. We, uh, we would have a little fellowship around the belt, Oftentimes, he would grab one hand and had the belt on the other, and, we, and as he used to say, we'd go ra we're going to go round and round <laughs> and do that little dance. <laughs> and uh, even though I, I had one of those personalities that they would call hyperactive today, now that I'm old, I don't have the energy to be hyperactive anymore. But the fact of the matter is, the Bible calls it sin. And because my parents disciplined me, that was one thing I knew, that I was a sinner. I mean, I believed that from way back. And that's what training your children up properly at least teaches them that they're sinners. They're rebelling against God. And that's why when I was nine years old, just sitting before an evening service one night at my Baptist church, it dawned on me, this is literally how I got saved. It dawned on me, I said, you know, if I were to die right now, I'd go to hell. I had that thought pop into my mind. And then my next thought was, I don't have to go to hell, I can accept Jesus. I can trust Jesus. And then my third thought was, I trust Jesus. And of course, good Southern Baptist, I walked the aisle during the invitation, had nothing to do with the guy's sermon or anything. It was just... Um, unusual that I was sitting and contemplating when I was nine years old. And uh, I, I believe God opened my heart to the things of the, of the gospel, and uh, I realized that I needed Christ uh, because I knew I was a sinner. And so the opposite of that is, is tickling their ears, telling everybody what they want to hear as fallen sinful people, enabling them to continue uh, in their lust of the flesh, etc., and so it says they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. The Greek word epithumos, <clears throat> which is translated lust depending on whatever. It's a neutral word. The word lust in English is a bad, always a bad word, bad connotation. But epithumos can be a good word. For example, in 1 Timothy 3.1, it says he that epithumos desires to be a presbyteros, desires a good thing and obtaineth favor from the Lord. See, so here he's saying, uh, obviously he's implying a negative overtone here. You know, uh, and so people who, uh, pastors are selected in so, these kind of churches based on their personality, uh, whether they're a nice person or not, 
you know, the fact that they fit into the contemporary culture in a way that is not offensive and they make people feel good about themselves. So they get to feel good about going to hell, basically, because they never hear the gospel. And turn away, and will turn away their ears from the truth. You know, I've, I've seen situations just in my Southern Baptist upbringing where when you proclaim the truth, people get upset, they get mad at you. It's the truth, but they were supposed to uh, be Bible believers, right? They were supposed to be Bible believers, but some didn't want to hear it. And we hear this today. I mean, the, uh, you, you look at what's going on in the church today, they do not often want to hear the truth, and they turn away from the truth. And God, <clears throat> so you, you can't have a vacuum. And so that vacuum of lacking the truth, what does it do? It sucks up myths. It sucks up false news stories and wants them to be true. In fact, I read today, this is not within the church, but that there's a place you can go in New York City with those uh, alternate reality, you know, uh, that you put on, and, and it pretends like Hillary won the presidency. <laughs> and so it's surrounded as if Hillary was the president. And uh, I, it, they say it's quite popular there in New York City. Uh, you know, so an alternate universe, an alternate reality, they turn aside to myths, uh, movies, and, uh, you know, corrupt, corruption of the truth. And, and Peter says, we don't follow cleverly devised myths or tales, but things that are revealed from the Word of God. Because it's not just God telling us the facts, it's God telling us the facts and the proper interpretation of the facts. That's what the Bible provides, the proper understanding. And so that's what happens in the church. They turn aside to myths. I mean, you can look down at the Roman Catholic Church, Mary, you know, the, the, the idolatry of Mary in the biblical church. I'm sure she would be embarrassed to know that she has been exalted to such a blasphemous position within the Roman Catholic Church, for example. Or uh, some want to have her as the fourth member of the Trinity. You know, things like this. And so that those are mythological things. Lewis Berry Chafer said, a very extensive body of scripture bears on the last days for the church. That's what I've been talking about. Reference is to a restricted time at the very end of, and yet wholly within the present age. I mean, if there was a sign relating to the church of the end of the church age, it's apostasy. You see what I'm saying? Uh, though this brief period immediately precedes the great tribulation and in some measure is a preparation for it, these two times of apostasy and confusion though incomparable in history, are wholly separate, uh, the one from the other. And so he taught, and I agree with him, that this is something that an extensive body of Scripture talks about. He went on to say, those Scriptures which set forth the last days for the church give no consideration to political or world conditions. See, that's one of the things you, uh, about the pre trib rapture. You do not know if a region of the world like America or the world as a whole is going to be on an upswing economically or downswing economically. See, because nothing uh, that's happening socio-politically relates to the rapture. I mean, it's very likely we're, we're going to be on a downswing as we prepare for the tribulation, but nevertheless... Uh, you don't know. You cannot tell from the, what's happening in the world uh, that we're near. Now, I would argue that you can, you know, the fact that Israel's back in the land 
is uh, something God has done in our day in preparation for this. So I think it means we're probably pretty near. But he, it says that give no consideration to political or world conditions, are, but are confined to the church itself. And that's what I keep stressing. I've heard so many sermons over the years where they preach these passages and they talk about what's happening in the world. It's not talking about the world. It's talking what's happening in the church. And in Christendom, these scripture pictures Man, men as departing from the faith. There will be a, the faith. That's the objective genitive here. In other words, the doctrinal position of the church here. There will be a manifestation of characteristics which belong to unregenerate men, though it is under the profession of a form of godliness, as we saw a moment ago in 2 Timothy 3. The indication of that, having denied the power of the blood of Christ, the leaders in these forms of righteousness will be unregenerate men who, uh, from whom nothing more spiritual than this could proceed. And so are they not acting as mere men? Now, old Charlie Clough came up with what he calls two truth tests from the Old Testament in Deuteronomy. He says, but the prophet, this is truth test number one, that Israel was supposed to apply uh, during the, uh, under the Mosaic law. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he shall speak in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And you may say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. So if he gives a prophecy and it doesn't happen, then that is really easy to tell that he's not a prophet of God. And we've got guys who claim to be prophets in the church today who give all kinds of prophecies. You know, the blood moons, If you hopefully you didn't follow that. Well, it's come and gone. It didn't happen. Jesus was going to come back in 1988, remember? And then he said, whoops, I miscalculated. And he came out next year with a book called 89 Reasons in 19, why he's going to come back in 1989. He was wrong again, a two-time loser. And uh, you have all of these kinds of things. Something was supposed to happen in the year 2012, and all of these kinds of things, not to mention uh, just personal prop prophecies that you have in some charismatic circles of you should do this or this is going to happen to you personally in your life. Well, when it doesn't, you know that this is not from the Lord, right? That's pretty easy. But then you have truth test number two, which is a little more difficult in Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3. It says, if a prophet or a dream of dreams rises among you and gives a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. Now, Satan's not going to come along and say, hey, you want to sin? Let me tell you some false doctrine. No, Satan is going to try to pass it off as true, as the truth. But he's saying if a prophet or dreamer of dream comes along and his message in essence is let's go after other gods. In other words, if, it, if the content of what he's saying leads you to go in a different direction than what the Bible has already taught you in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ, then uh, you're not to uh, listen to him. So you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer or dream, for the Lord your God is testing you. So if he does something and it comes true, a sign or a wonder, but he has a wrong message, you see, content. And this is why the it always comes down to content. We saw Sunday that the Antichrist is going to be given the power to do false signs and wonders. And so it's always about truth. It's always about the content of what someone's saying. 
not whether they either do a false miracle, some people fake miracles, but apparently in the future, they're going to be given temporarily the ability to do actual uh, supernatural miracles. For the Lord your God is testing you to find out what? If you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And so those are the two truth tests that Israel had. And what happened in Israel, Deuteronomy 13, 5, if you were a false prophet? Well, it says, but that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord, your God, who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you from the way in which the Lord, your God, commanded you to walk. So you shall purge evil from among you. Now, a lot of people don't think this stuff is that important. You know, the content of what, a, what is taught in churches and things like this. Oh, it's not that big a deal. He's, you know, roughly in line with the Bible, you know, but I don't want to be too hard on him. After all, he's such a nice guy, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. But the Bible takes it very, very seriously. There's not a record of any Old Testament prophet being put to death for false prophecy. Uh, but the Bible said you should, a righteous Jewish community should stone, and we're not talking about anything relating to smoking LSD here, should stone the prophet. And so if you were a false teacher in Israel, you were supposed to end up a rock pile, basically. And so they were supposed to be stoned as part of God's judgment on them. Okay, that's enough. <clears throat> but when you come to the New Testament, we have, a, we have similar truth tests that are prescribed in the New Testament. And I think this is one of them in 1 John 4, 1 through 6. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Now, how do you test a spirit? You test, you don't, you know, go, you know, or some people go, oh, I feel the spirit a certain way or this or that. I, I feel that your spirit is not right. No, you test the spirit because a spirit, when it comes to truth testing, produces words, produces content. So you test the spirits by producing what they say or what they're teaching here. And it says, because many false prophets, see prophets here, they prophesy, have gone out into the world. <clears throat> By this you know the Spirit of God. In other words, what the God, the Holy Spirit produces in a person. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And it's believed that the background for uh, first John was docetism, the belief that people did not believe that Jesus actually came in the flesh, that he was just some ghost-like spirit that came. And uh, therefore, that was called docetism, and that the, an early form of it was circulating uh, in, uh, among those that John was writing to in first John. <clears throat> and he says, but and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist. See, back in chapter 2, he said, you have heard that Antichrist is coming. A reference to a specific future Antichrist. And he says, but many Antichrists have already gone out into the world. Yes, an Antichrist is coming during the tribulation, you see. But... There are many antichrists who have gone out into the world, not the antichrist, uh, also called the beast in the book of Revelation or the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians. But he's, So he's talking about that which he had introduced in chapter 2. And uh, so he's saying um, <clears throat> is now already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. That is a reference to the Holy Spirit. They are from the world. 
Therefore, they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. And so you, what you do is you test the spirits, you test the content of what they say. Uh, the spirit is what motivates you. You see this explained by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It says, who can know the spirit of a man except the mind of, and, and, and he talks about the spirit of, of God has given us the mind of Christ, basically, is what he's saying there. Uh, they are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. And, and this is talking about in the church again as well. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. And who are we? The apostles. See, the apostles have been solidified. He says this back in chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, that if you follow us, the apostles, then you're following Christ because we've been sent by him. And so now he is giving scripture a revelation. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And once again, at the practical level, it boils down to does something measure up uh, with the, the spirit of God. And we see in Second uh, Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 17, about how he says, but you, in contrast to the false teaching, followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, and faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. And so here you have uh, him telling them, in essence, that you need to follow the word of God that you know is true. In other words, the counter action to these false teachers is not to follow them, but to continue or maintain the faith that you know is true. And that's what he's saying here. And he's showing that he endured all of this suffering, the apostle Paul here, um, because he, the, the, uh, the Lord delivered him from it. And indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, you know, possibly even within the church. In fact, more and more likely within the church. You know, don't forget, it's the church, the false church, that's going to help facilitate the Antichrist after the rapture. Um, and we're seeing many people doing this kind of thing. And then he says... <clears throat> But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse. That's the passage I quoted at the beginning. <laughs> Cheer up, it's going to get worse before it gets worse, you know. And so it, it hasn't gotten better. Uh, post, I don't see how post-millennialists are able to deal with this passage. One of them says, well, it goes on and says, uh, deceiving and being deceived, and... Um, they like to quote from a, another passage about how a certain heretic is mentioned in Timothy and say, but he will, and then it says that he, he will not make any further progress. So they say he, that was referring to a particular person in the first century who was nipped in the bud, you know, as Barney used to say, nip it in the bud. And uh, therefore, that's how they try to get around this passage about evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You know, the problem with the person who's deceived is they're deceived, and they don't know it. A deceived person does not realize they're deceived. That's why they can be so sincere and everything. And I hear people say, oh, they're so sincere, they can't be wrong. See, that kind of mentality is not looking at the content of what someone's saying. But they're, you know, looking at the body language or something like that. And so these evil men and imposters uh, who were described in a different passage as having their consciences seared, you know, meaning that they don't know right from wrong, they are deceived and as a result, all they can do is deceive other people. You, however, continue in the things that you have learned. See, this is the antidote. You know, continue 
from the things that you know are true from the Word of God. He's talking to, uh, of course, Timothy here, and uh, this portion of Scripture is being written at this time, but he's saying that, uh, in other words, it's the Scripture, probably a reference to the Old Testament, as well as his own writings, you continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, that from your childhood you have known the sacred writings. And that's clearly a reference to uh, the Old Testament here. In other words, the New Testament lines up with and is on the same trajectory as the Old Testament. And it's a fulfillment in some instances, but it's a continuation in the same truth tra tradition as the Old Testament. And uh, so he, he, he learned this, we learned from his mother and grandmother uh, in another passage, that are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching. Uh, and so we see that he's probably once again referring to the Old Testament here, canon, but it would include all Scripture, as it says. In other words, it includes the New Testament as well, and inspired means God-breathed, that, that, that God is the one that exhaled, so to speak, this and uh, it is profitable for teaching, as opposed to the doctrines of demons, you know, that come, uh, that produces false doctrine. And so we see it lists the four things here, teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. And so you have a model here for how, what a pastor teacher is supposed to do. You have to teach the Word of God, and this is the word from we get the word doctrine from. Doctrine, teaching doctrine. Uh, so that people understand what is being said. Because you have to understand things in order to do what? To realize that my life needs reproof, and that means to point out an area where you're going wrong in. And then correction... Well, so you understand the doctrine, you, you see the reproof that it gives in your life, and then you're able to change it or correct it. Because the Word of God gives you that wisdom that he referred to earlier, and uh, then you do training in righteousness. Is third area, you reestablish the area you're messing up in with godly habits and training in your life. And so that's the thing. So you first have to understand the doctrine, the scripture behind it. And then that enables you, as you have this understanding, to see problems in your own area, in your own life. And then you'll know what to correct and train in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And Here's the same Greek word that is used for adequate and equipped, but used in a different way. Adequate refers to the training aspect of a military soldier here. In other words, having proper training, but to be successful in, in the battle, you also need the proper equipment. And it's saying that the Bible is able to equip you or train you adequately and it's able to give you equipment that you need outfitting you uh, for every good work that will come into your life so the word of god is the basis of sufficiency for uh, living the christian life you don't need the word of god mixed with a certain percentage of psychology or human viewpoint mixed in. No, you just need divine viewpoint. You need the Word of God that is able to uh, prepare you for, di for dealing with every situation that may or may not occur. So we see that the Bible warns us here about the uh, coming apostasy, 
that's going to come in the last days. And very, 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 very likely it's referring to our own times. And we tend to look at things in relation to just the United States and how everything's going here. But believe me, it apostasy is spread all over the world. And even though you have newer areas like China where the gospel is prospering, they have plenty of false doctrine over there as well. And uh, we see that God's word, of, word is what straightens people out. And you have to be open or positive to the word of God to be able for it to have its proper effect in your life. And so this was written specifically to pastors to tell them to harp on these issues when they teach the Word of God because people need encouragement as they're facing the difficult times at the end of the church age. And so I think it's encouraging to know that the Bible has pointed out what's wrong with our churches and society as well. But the fact is that we need to be encouraged to continue in what we have learned from many of us from our youth and not stray from that. And so the Apostle Paul in his final statement in 2 Timothy says, I have fought the fight, I have kept the course, I have finished the race. So whether we are taken to be with the Lord at the rapture or we die and go to be with the Lord at that point, we hopefully we'll be able to say, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the faith, I have kept the thing, and learning the word of God encourages us to that end. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your grace and your provision, the fact that you tell us the truth, you warn us, even though, as Jude said, he wanted to write a nice encouraging letter, but the threat of apostasy was so great that he had to deal with that instead and you give us what we need in the word of god it's perfectly balanced as we study it and read it and apply it and we pray that you would make sure that we all are equipped and adequate for every good work that comes into our life that you would have us do and we know that, as Ephesians says, you've saved us unto good works. You've saved us by grace, and you've destined good works described in the New Testament that we should walk in them. And so we pray that you would use us as we pursue you through the word in this way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.